Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're delighted to welcome you to the fourth in our series of Zoom meetings arranged by Liberal Voice for Women. We are a special interest group of Liberal Democrat members and supporters aiming to promote the interests of women and girls within our party. We're focusing in these meetings upon topics which we feel the Liberal Democrats need to understand and discuss openly. We're not convinced that the party's current policy on policy document on prostitution um, is actually in the interests of girls and women. Uh, you can see it, I think it's on in the chat somewhere up at the top. If it isn't, it will be before the end of the, before the, end of the session and then you can uh, click on that and uh, look at it later. Um, tonight we've got two speakers. We have Julie Bindle, um, a famous journalist and our party member and councillor, Dr. Jackie Stoyle. Now, Julie's got to leave promptly at 7.30. So we're going to crack on as soon as we can. Uh, we're going to be discussing topics which may well have affected you or members of your family. I'm sure you're aware that to do them justice, we mustn't shirk from the responsibility of confronting reality and hard fact. Uh, Jackie in particular will be showing some graphic images as part of her presentation. So if you need to, feel free to turn away at that point. Now, can I ask you to put your questions in the chat as we go along? And I'll call on you to ask Julie at the end of her segment and Jackie at the end of the uh, at the end of first. Please bear in mind that we are recording um, at this event and we hope we'll be able to share this recording on YouTube later. So please indicate when you write your questions, whether you'd like to ask it yourself or whether you prefer that I read it out for you. May I suggest that you put your Zoom screen on speaker view for the best view of the evening. Help yourself to ice creams and uh, canapé and enjoy your preferred drinks. Uh, now let me introduce you to our first speaker tonight. Julie Bindle has spent a lifetime as an investigative journalist dedicated to searching out the facts here about prostitution and its harms and has devoted much of her time to supporting victimised women, setting up justice for women and the annual Emma Humphreys Prize. You will have seen her brief biography when you registered for this evening, so I don't intend to repeat that. All I will say is that her last mention of our party was back in March, talking about the pervy Lib Dems. So I'm delighted, Julie, to welcome you here to speak to us, whose constitution's preamble commits us to support a society where no one shall be enslaved by poverty, ignorance or conformity. I'm not convinced that we have any more pervy members than the other parties, but maybe a greater proportion. Can't say. Anyway, Julie's next book is Feminism for Women. It's due out in September. You can order it at Bookshop. And I think the, uh, the, the link to that is going to be going in the chat as well. I just ordered it and uh, it's coming out, I think, on the 2nd of September. So get your, get your orders in now. Julie, can I ask you then? Uh, I'm going to switch to our active speaker. If you're not speaking at the moment, can I ask the rest of you to turn off your your cameras, your videos at the moment, because we have had a couple of bandwidth issues uh, and so it will help us. And the rest of you, turn to active speaker and that should be a really helpful, uh, a really helpful thing to do. Okay, Julie, over to you. Thank you. And I'm really um, very grateful to be able to talk with you this evening. And particularly seeing as I've been really rude, I think justifiably, <laughs> about many uh, Lib Dem policies nationally and locally. And I think necessarily because, of course, you know, we're all involved in politics, either with a big P or a small P. And I think it's good to keep um, to keep on top of mm -hmm. changing, uh, shifting perceptions. And of course, changing perceptions about issues that are extremely important, and one of which is the global sex trade, which affects half of the population, so three and a half billion women. And then, of course, I can hear people say, well, how on earth does it affect three and a half billion people, in other words, all women, when there are so few women in prostitution, and you might argue, so few men that pay for sex? Well, let's have a look at the message that it sends. But before that, Let's look at numbers. Now, I'm going to disappoint you here by saying that we can't ever pull out numbers of, out of a hat and use that as some kind of ammunition. For example, two million women are trafficked throughout 
um, Southeast Asia into Europe uh, every year, or there are X number of women who are being sexually exploited. In a sense, we don't need that because what we know is that the global sex trade, and within that I include pornography, stripping, mail order bride services, the so-called girlfriend experience, lap dance clubs, um, off street prostitution, on street prostitution, high class escorting, only fans, um, all of it. We know that this is a huge industry that encompasses directly millions of women and also a huge number of men that pay for sex. A huge number of men and some women that directly exploit, whether it's pimping, brothel owning, um, or less direct ways in which they earn money from the exploitation of women and girls. But more than that, more I think than those directly involved in the sex trade, there is a normative effect, and this is something that liberals should all be concerned about. It's about the message that is given to wider society, which is what I mean, of course, by normative effect. When a human being is bought and sold for the purposes, in this case, of one sided sexual pleasure. What does that say about the freedom, the relative freedom of the women and girls being bought and sold? when you compare it with the men that have the most choice, in my view, the most choice compared to those with the least choice. So when liberals say, well, who are we to argue against the commodification of the human body? Or in the case of prostitution, and they wouldn't put it as crudely as this because it looks bad for them, particular orifices or parts of the human body. They say, who are we to argue against that when we as liberals believe in the right of individuals to, for example, sell a kidney, give a kidney to someone in dire need of that? Well, first of all, women are clearly not making a choice out of an open choice. There is absolutely no way, even if some women say, and of course they do, that prostitution is a way that they choose to earn money. We all know that that choice comes out of a limited set of choices. So what does that mean for those that are consuming this so-called product? Well, it means that they have to dehumanize the product in order to consume the product. And I do hear many liberals compare prostitution with drugs and they do it by way of suggesting an alternative to criminalization. So they might say, for example, look at the war on drugs, look at how criminalizing small time drug dealers, drug consumers has led to not a decrease in the consumption of drugs, but an increase in the harm caused to those people that consume drugs. Well, I would agree with that. I absolutely would agree that it's an obscenity to criminalise the consumers of cannabis, for example, albeit we do need to be very careful in terms of our social messaging about harms, as we do with alcohol, as we do with, with tobacco. But the problem with comparing what we do legally and policy-wise with drugs with prostitution is that women are not inanimate objects. So what we're doing to the human body isn't about some kind of moralizing about the way in which sex should be conducted. It's not about laying the blame at the feet of women for having lots of sex, being sexual beings, because prostitution isn't, of course, about sex. It's about one sided sexual pleasure. Without the consent of the woman. We would normally call that rape, but because cash is involved, we don't. The other problem, of course, for liberals when we come to this issue is the notion of choice. So I mentioned earlier about the analogy with well, giving away a kidney to someone that needs it who would die without it. 
men who are um, impoverished in India, and I've seen men queue around hospitals in Mumbai waiting to sell blood because they can't afford to feed themselves or their families. And why is this any different from prostitution? Well, of course, we should condemn any harmful practice that people are forced to take as the last option, rather than say, let's actually destigmatize the selling of a kidney. Let's destigmatize the selling of blood. Let's make prostitution something that is available to all girls, including those in private schools from very wealthy families. This is absolutely no different from any other way of making money. And of course, the problem is that when we talk about choice, when we talk about the women, the very few women that are representatives of the pimping end of the sex trade, that will appear in the media, it's social media or mainstream media, and say, I'm a sex worker, I choose this, I'm happy, I love doing this, how dare you tell me what to do with my body or what not to do with my body. Of course, feminists aren't doing this at all, and nor should any liberals. What we're doing is, or what we should be doing, is stigmatizing the men, because it is the men who wish to purchase sex from disenfranchised and desperate women. So the choice argument is a smokescreen for men who wish to have sex with those that don't wish to have sex with them were it not for the cash. The legislation that we're trying to persuade our governments to adopt, known as the Nordic model, but I prefer to use the term the abolitionist model because of course it's now adopted in countries outside of Norway, where the selling of sex is decriminalized for all prostituted people, men, women, transgender people, of course, children, but that the purchasing of sex, whether or not these buyers were aware that this person was coerced, trafficked, otherwise abused, in other words, straightforwardly prostituted will do, gives a message, doesn't it, to wider society that no civilised society that truly believes in equality between women and men, that truly believes in an end to oppression and the systems of oppression, would ever defend the global sex trade. Because as good liberals, we're supposed to look at the most disenfranchised women before we look at the women at the top of the tree. So my feminism, and this is what makes me not a liberal feminist, but a feminist who of course has some liberal sensibilities. My feminism is not concerned with the glass ceiling with women at the top of the tree who are complaining that they don't earn a million dollars annual salary when their male counterparts do although that clearly is discriminatory, unfair, etc. My feminism is concerned with the women at the very bottom. And it's women at the very bottom of the pile that we are supposed to be concerned with more. Now, who are the women in prostitution? If you go to Canada, they are native, indigenous women. The same in Australia, Aboriginal women in New Zealand, the same native women, indigenous women and girls. If you look at um, across North America, African-American girls and women, poor women, abused women, brown women, Asian women, where men will choose women as if they're shopping from a catalogue of racialized, abused human beings. So they might decide that Thai women, for example, are going to be more compliant because of the racist stereotypes about women um, from particular uh, parts of Asia. They may decide if they're white men, that African-American women are exotic, they're different. They buy them like they're in a sweet shop. And so these are the women, the women who are often trained into prostitution 
by the boot camp of childhood sexual abuse, residential care and neglect. These are the women that we should concern ourselves with. And of course, if there are women who are wealthy, who are in prostitution, but who have schooled their three kids privately, they've got a second home in the Cotswolds, they're perfectly happy, they've got a beautiful home, they've never been raped, they've never been addicted to prescription drugs or hard drugs or alcohol. Great, okay, they are definitely the exception. They are the minority, which is why they shouldn't speak for the majority of women. We don't make law and policy based on minority experience. We know that in the wake of Black Lives Matter in the UK or the US, if a 30 year old black man, for example, black British man said about the demonstrations, about the protests, about the hate crime legislation relating to incitement to racial hatred. If he said, what's all this about? This is nonsense, this is patronizing to me. It's disenfranchising me and my community to suggest that we're victims of racism. I have never experienced racism in my life. We would say that's really good and I'm delighted for you, but we're not going to base legislation and policy on your experience because you are in a minority. So how therefore can Lib Dem leaders listen to atypical individuals telling stories that are so just, yes, atypical in the extreme and decide to impose policy and legislation upon societies in which the vast majority of prostituted women are at the bottom of the pile? And how dare we as a society bend over backwards to allow and make it easier for even men to pay for sex by saying, and this is another liberal line, for example, what about disabled men? What about the men who can't get a real date? What about the war veterans who've come back from name your war um, with their legs blown off and they're desperate for human contact? We've got to give them access to sex workers. That argument, if we buy it, because of course it's deeply offensive to disabled people as well, and no one has a right to sex, that argument can well be extended and has been extended to, once you accept it, men who just are boring, unattractive and unappealing to women. What are we supposed to do? Decide that there is some kind of obligation to give them some kind of pseudo date, in other words, prostituted sex. So what we have to do is think about what human rights really are. Now, I often speak about this because I think it's so pertinent to the hypocrisy amongst men that would call themselves decent liberals in the way that they defend and uphold the systems of prostitution. Kenneth Roth, who was the highly paid white privileged director of Human Rights Watch, said back in 2015, when Amnesty International an organization that may as well just call itself a men's rights movement as opposed to human rights movement, decided that they were going to adopt a policy that supported blanket decriminalization worldwide. Of course, abolitionist feminists, myself included, took to social media saying this was a disgrace. This was pure misogyny. This was about men's rights to sexual access to the most disenfranchised of women. Our sisters in countries in the global south pointed out that black and brown women, indigenous women, are the most victimized within prostitution. And Kenneth Roth came back and said something like, and you can find his tweet, which has been handily screenshot all over. Yes, I'm sure many of us are very critical of the sex trade or sex work, as he would have put it. But why remove the opportunity for poor women 
to earn a living this way. And my dear friend and colleague, Rachel Moran, author of Paid For, My Journey Through Prostitution, a sex trade survivor who set up the organisation Space International said, embrace yourself, everyone. There's a bit of a rude word coming here, but it's in context. She wrote back on Twitter, surely what you do when a woman is hungry is put food in her mouth and not your cock. And I think this speaks volumes about the way that prostitution is seen as something that's a right for men. We masquerade the abuse of women by talking about choice. We think that we're doing right by prostituted women and wider society by calling for blanket decriminalization when we can see from countries such as New Zealand and elsewhere that this has been an unmitigated disaster, has grown the sex trade, has increased the number of illegal prostitution venues, has encouraged pimps and traffickers to sell their wares because women are their wares within decriminalized venues because it becomes less of an issue for the police. We need to call upon all politicians, policymakers, and citizens to condemn prostitution in the way that the slave trade was condemned. And we need to condemn it in the way that we condemn all other forms of institutionalized misogyny within society. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you very much, Julie. That's a, a really good uh... Uh, rundown of actually with a comment there's over 350 pages in your book it's taken me weeks to read <laughs> but uh, that's an overview of, of what you said in the book and it's I recommend it actually to anybody to read uh, it's well worth reading um, we do have some questions and I know we're, we're on the clock here now um, a resident of Bournemouth asks uh, I live in Bournemouth where we have had recent horrific attacks on prostituted women in their own homes we have a harm minimization project, it says, funded by the NHS. As local feminists, what should we be calling for? Well, of course, harm minimization alongside well-funded, well-organized exit programs where women are enabled to leave the sex trade because of course the vast majority want to do just that, so long as they're asked properly, um, and carefully and presented as something that she has control over. Harm minimization is, is crucial because of course it keeps women alive and relatively safe in terms of HIV, prevention, pregnancy, other STIs, um, et cetera, in the meantime. So we're talking about condoms. We're talking about clean needles um, and you know, this is basically a sticking plaster on a much bigger problem. As, as you'll well know, the person whose name, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear, um, um, who, who, you know, you, you asked a question because I think that you know that what is needed is funding and support and commitment for women to exit as opposed to keeping women in prostitution. And some of the worst examples of so-called harm minimization I've seen have been in those countries that have legalized or decriminalized their sex trade. Because why do you need an exit program to get out of journalism, for example, or local politics um, or research or working as a pharmacist? You don't need an exit program, but you do when it's prostitution because of how entrenched women are and the effects on physical and mental health. So what we should be doing is putting pressure on our governments to provide funding and support for these exit programs, but not run, and this is no disrespect to anyone who has a faith, not run by religious organizations that impose their religious doctrine on women, but run by those that give a very clear commitment, which is a, um, the words escape me, it's not, um, help me. It, it's not patronising, but it's also not, you're not being told, and the word is here, I will go mad afterwards. It's not conditional. So you can't, you can't then impose conditions upon women. You have to say, what do you need? And 
we will provide that support for you and also peer support from women who have exited and who themselves are experts in this topic. Okay, that sounds great. Um, uh, maybe we might have time for a follow up if, if the person from Bournemouth is, it needs more information. We've got another question from Melissa Cohen. Do you want to ask your own question, Melissa? Uh, unmute yourself if you do. And we'll have another question from NB um, later on. I, I might ask that myself if you don't want to ask it. Melissa, are you ready to ask your question? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Uh, yep. I would like to know, I, I totally, uh, uh, I've learned a lot from Julie's um, deconstruction of prostitution. It's really, really um, been helpful to me. Yeah. But I was wondering that um, the idea of, sorry, men in prostitution or um, men who wish to be perceived as women in prostitution, I wonder if that they're exploited in the same way or if they're viewed in the same way. Please, could you please address that? I'm grateful for the question. And I think that all prostitution um, is harmful. Prostitution is harmful towards all prostituted people, including transgender people, including women, men, um, and uh, for, uh, all age groups. I do think there are differences, however, in the way that men are prostituted, the way that trans women are prostituted and women, because of course there are ways in which men will dehumanize women because of the way we were raised as girls and the status or rather lack of it afforded us as girls and i think there's also a more profound set of effects and consequences for women who are being sexually violated who've grown up um, as girls under patriarchy because it's an extension and a continuation of that i have spoken to some trans people, so um, uh, men who live as women, who identify as women, who talk about the abuse within prostitution, but also some that say that they have purposely sought prostitution experiences in order to test their new identity as women. Because of course, what they have done, and this doesn't apply to all trans women, but it certainly does to some, what they have done is eroticized the submission of women, of females in society, and have almost celebrated the way in which we are sexually humiliated. So there are differences, but I still think in the end, prostitution affects all prostituted people and in a very negative way. We've got another question. There's several questions, so we've got to crack on with these. Uh, do you think that UBI, Universal um, Basic Income, and Minimum Standards of Living would stop or reduce the sexual exploitation of women and girls? Well, possibly it might reduce, you know, some um, cases where women have been coerced and exploited onto the streets or into brothels because the exploiter knows that they are desperate for money. So in other words, it's yet another tool to be used. It's another aspect of vulnerability that can be exploited. But poverty does not cause prostitution. Patriarchy, sexual violence, men, the sex trade, the normalization of the sexual abuse and commercial sexual exploitation of women is what causes prostitution. And then there are certain push factors as well as pull factors. So what we have, from some hard left groups, for example, the English Collective of Prostitutes based in London, um, here in England, you know, they will insist that if the government um, sorted out the benefit system and ended poverty and supported single mothers better, then these women wouldn't have to sell sex to feed their kids. Well, it's a nice idea that you could actually stop prostitution by ending poverty, but you'd have to end patriarchy at the same time. Yeah, good. Okay, uh, it's actually not at seven thirty. Have you got time for one last question, or do we have to say goodbye? Okay, one last question um, is: 
Uh, there was a disturbing report in today's Times about a, 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 a policing county lines which reported that young teenage groomed girls are being handed around as so called, which are often Airbnb rentals. How can we address that shocking state of affairs? Well, first of all, we need to have a look at who the girls are disclosing. Um, their abuse too, and whether the police take them seriously, whether social services, health workers, their parents take them seriously. Because as we've seen with Rochdale, Rotherham, many other investigations into so-called grooming gangs that I just call pimping and rape gangs, often police officers will just dismiss this as though it's, and one police officer did say, this is a lifestyle choice. This is something that the girls are choosing, which is horrendous. Well, how we address it is we stop normalizing the sex trade to the extent that we think if we just get it off the streets and off street, it will be fine. These Airbnbs are off street prostitution venues. In what way is that any better for the girls in terms of their exploitation than if they were being picked up in cars on the street? I see no difference. So we need to condemn prostitution, condemn the buyers and the exploiters and support the prostituted women and, and, and girls, and of course, men and boys. Oh, well, that was brilliant. I, I'm, I'm so sorry that we've, you've got, we've got to lose you. Uh, it was a really brilliant talk. Thank you, Julie, for a fascinating unwrapping of your book. Um, and, and reading it to be ready for tonight was sometimes painful and, and frequently astonishing to think of the access you gained to people who were prepared to speak quite candidly about their lives. Um, so thank you so much for being with us. And I hope we can have you back uh, another time uh, when we won't be quite so pervy. <laughs> okay. Anytime. Cheers. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Cheers. Uh, and now um, it's over to Jackie Stoyle because uh, let's see. Jackie, you're a Lib Dem PPC for Inverclyde in Scotland in uh, 2019. Um, you were secretary. You are secretary of the cross-party group on commercial sexual exploitation at, at Holyrood. Um, your career has taken you from nursing to lecturing to prison education at Barlini and Green Greenock, Greenock, mm -hmm. and has Greenock. been our Greenock, and you've been our European Westminster and Holyrood candidate. Uh, Jackie is a stalwart supporter of the Nordic model. And she's going to tell us, which uh, now seems to be the abolitionist model, Julie's saying, mm -hmm. and you're going to tell us a bit about commercial sexual exploitation and recently your recent inquiry at Hollywood into the sexual exploitation websites. Thank you. Can I ask the rest of you to turn off your uh, your videos if you're not talking and um, that will help prevent any any uh, problems we have with bandwidth. Thank you so much. All right, good evening, everybody. And um, I'm going to share my screen in a minute. I'll just do a, a little bit of an introduction. So, um, and add one thing uh, to what Alison said that might be pertinent here. I also um, bravely took a motion to the Scottish Conference in 2018 for the Nordic model. I managed to get 27 nominations um, across Scotland. And before I took the motion to conference, I put on a fringe with Ju um, Fiona Broadfoot, who is a prostitution survivor. I managed to get Willie Rennie and Joe Swinson in the room as well. And um, there was also people from uh, Tara, which is the, um, and roots out in, in, in Glasgow for helping women exit and looking after, after traffic women. But it was Fiona and, um, who brought the room to a hush. You could have heard a pin drop. And people came up to us afterwards and said what, you know, a powerful speaker she was, she is. Um, I had Diane Martin uh, Robertson, who summated, who's another prostitution survivor, who summated the um, motion and was voted the best speaker of the conference when I put it in. He, he, only Lib Dems, don't you love us? Only Lib Dems could do that and vote against the motion. Anyway, which they did, but a third of the audience, a third of the audience were 
with us. So um, I've had to wait and bide my time because I, you, you can't put, keep putting a motion in that's fallen, I'm sure you know that. Um, so what I'm going to, I've, I've been um, uh, campaigning against prostitution and trafficking for about 17 years. As part of the grassroots group, so when in, in Parliament, in the Scottish Parliament, so when we became a CPG, uh, I became the Secretariat. And recently we've had um, an inquiry into what are euphemistically called adult service websites, but we call sexual exploitation advertising websites. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to show you a screenshot of one of those websites. And there had been screenshots in the inquiry, so I, emailed my uh, colleague and asked if she would send them and anyway, she hadn't. So I thought, oh, I'm gonna have to do this myself. Sully my computer and go into one. And um, it was so easy. It was horribly easy. You go into Google, you click one of the biggest ones, v Viva Street, you click Escort and Massage and, and you come into this. So now, Bear with me, I'm going to screen share. And here we go. So I uh, want to zoom this. Hang on a second. Now, I want to tell you that when I first went in, it's a bit like, you know, the commodities for cars. Um, you know, you, you go in and it tells you how many cars are on the site and you can then click. So for the UK, on the day that I went in, 12,440 women were for sale. So I brought it in, I put Scotland in, that brought me down to 788. And then you can do like Edinburgh, um, Glasgow, uh, Aberdeen, and that will tell you how many in those places. So having a look here, you can see Viva Street at the top. Nikki, new Japanese model, only one week. That's probably because they are moving them around, but also never expect any truth to be on. Um, I'm just going to shorten sexual exploitation advertising website to exploitation website, I will not call it adult services. Um, I don't, this, so you've got a photograph and you've got a place for calling, send a message or um, a, a notice here. Scrolling down, it tells you the postcode, Glasgow Central, type of ad, independent. Um, the, Scottish have a word for that, it's yeah, right. In one of our witnesses in the inquiry um, from Ireland said in Ireland that 97% of uh, women advertised were foreign. So as this um, young woman is here and therefore is extremely unlikely that she is independent. I don't see how such a young girl can have come all the way from uh, the Orient, wherever it is that she's come from, financially set herself up in a flat, use a webcam, be technologically expert, speak English, which actually says she speaks English here. Both that and being in independent are usually untrue. Age 28 years old, well, she looks about 15 to me. Uh, even even less but anyway who knows I doubt she's as old as that now then this is one of the most sinister things and it's actually unusual because um, I've got another one actually where the only thing that has a red x is a levels a levels meaning anal sex uh, this uh, usually most of these are ticked. So that's quite a red flag if most of them are ticked. It's unusual to see this. 
Then you've got your rates, how much it is for 15 minutes, that, well, it's nothing, 30 minutes or an hour. So that's £100 an hour. But if you wanted to have a service, then that would be extra. And then that's her description for herself, which um, obviously for trafficked women, pimp, you know, women, they haven't written that. Interesting that um, for Viva Streets, who sell traffic women on their um, site, your safety to the buyer is of paramount importance to us, but the um, young girl here, obviously her safety is not. So they've got a little thing here saying that um, they've got, uh, if you don't, you know, because of COVID, if you don't want to have bodily contact, they've got galleries, coming, phone line services. And you have um, this thing about only one week. That may or may not be true, but if it is true, it means that this girl will be here in Glasgow for a week and then she'll be somewhere else. Traffickers move their um, women around. They have pop-up brothels. They uh, don't allow the women um, to get um, any sense of orientation of where they are, make any relationships with people. Um, they keep them confused, disorientated. That helps to manage them as slaves, which in fact, I believe that is exactly what they are. So um, it also keeps that means they can keep a woman fresh to a whole range of customers because she'll be fresh to Glaswegian men or Edinburgh men, or then she may of course move all around the UK. So um, what happens as well, if you are a buyer, you can use a prepaid card. So you, that's what, like a travel card, you can put money on it. There's nothing that traces back to you. The girl will have had photographs taken, but she may have no idea whatsoever that she's being advertised and that these photographs are going onto um, a, a website or into a gallery or being sold as just the, the photographs. She'll have no idea what services that she's agreed to. Often buyers will complain um, on their website, on, they've got this pen to review websites, how just like people review cars and other commodities, women as a commodity are reviewed on sites. I find the whole thing um, absolutely uh, abhorrent and disgusting and I can't bear it when people say slavery has ended. So, um, sorry, I got a bit sidetracked. Uh, they will review women and say things like, oh, what, this person I spoke to on the phone could speak English, but when they get there, they'll complain because the girl couldn't speak English. But she doesn't know what has been agreed to and negotiated with the trafficker or the pimp. So um, she's, it continue, the, the, the abuse and the trauma is just compounded all the time because the websites have made um, this so easy. It incentivizes trafficking and it means that it's easy for the buyer, it's easy for the trafficker and the pimp. So um, instead of a, 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 you know, seeing a few people a night, then they may be seeing, you know, well, dozens, 10 more. So it's a, it, it is a form of torture. There's absolutely no doubt about that whatsoever. Um, now, in Scotland, and I think in the UK, advertising, the, the website advertising prostitution is legal. So there's um, no, no, the police cannot uh, bring the websites down because it's legal. Now, what I'm going to do, if um, I'm going to stop the share,
and I have, <laughs> I'm, I'm using my um, notes, so, um, right, just to check what I've said to you, um, yeah, the photographs, if uh, sometimes when the, the women are rescued or um, if they manage to exit prostitution, they want to take the photographs down, they can't do so easily. It takes seconds to upload, but they can't get them down. Now, one, uh, Lynn, Linda Thompson from Women's Support Project told us about a woman who had to pay 400 pounds to the website, 400 pounds to get her photographs taken down. So obviously she was exiting prostitution and she had to go back and sell sex to four men in order to pay for her photographs to come down. So we had one um, woman come as a witness who was a survivor of the websites. We've called her Meg Megan King, but that's a pseudonym, that's not her real name. Now, she was introduced to prostitution um, by her pimp on a website. She didn't even know she'd been advertised. She was sold into prostitution from, from a traumatic um, situation. And she had, um, what she says about how it happens, Often the traffickers will get the, the women to under duress to ring up because you have to have a passport and you have to have a photograph. Sometimes though, it's in her case, she said her pimp's wife put all his women onto the website because the website doesn't know that whether the person being sold is the person in the photograph. So it can be another another girl. So, um, and all of the things, all the money that he made from through the website, she had her photographs also sold. Um, she has no idea how many. She has no idea who bought them. She's that they're just out there, and. He was actually caught, her pin, and went to prison, and they will be able to get money back from him under the proceeds of crime. But the website, the, 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 because it's not illegal, they um, have made money out of her, out of procuring her prostitution, and there's no way that that money can be reclaimed. So, um, Roseanne Cameron from Roots Out, she said that um, they did a scoping exercise in Glasgow with some of the other organisations that helped them in exit. And they, they looked on the websites. There's a website for men looking for prostitution and they outweighed the number of people compared to the number of women selling. Some of their comments were from the men, any single mum struggling with this lockdown and coronavirus willing to do something? Used to pick up this lassie round here, gave the name of the street. She was mental and damaged, but gave a good blow job. Her name was, and they gave her name. Anyone know her or if she's still in the game in Glasgow? And troops, I was in the town over the weekend and I saw quite a few working girls in the city centre looking for work. I couldn't indulge as I had my missus with me. So this is a way that punters talk about young, trauma, traumatised women. Um, just going to say what Rhoda Grant, the, our two conveners are Rhoda Grant, who's the MSP for Labour, and Ruth McGuire, who's... Um, SNP, MSP, they're co-conveners. Anyway, she asked Megan if the websites made prostitution safer. And Megan said she didn't believe that they made anybody safer. Although sex buyers can be reviewed on a particular website, they are able to make bookings without verifying their identity. 
She was subjected to dangerous situations, including an experience where a sex buyer who contacted her via the online advert wanted her to watch videos of child exploitation and pretend to be a child. Through her role in supporting women to exit prostitution, she heard uh, women recount stories of men who um, would refuse to pay and then raped women, who uh, coerced women to have unprotected sex, and one woman uh, turned up to find six men present for, for her services. So I want to turn to uh, the criminal justice system and ask, is this actually legal? And I think I've told you that in fact it is. We had um, a, a prosecutor, Claire Chambers, I know her name's Chambers from Compass Chambers, um, but she was unequivocal. She said that, that she couldn't identify any legislation whatsoever that we currently have to take the websites down. Even the trafficking legislation, the problem with that is it's not directly responsible. So even though they incentivize it, um, it it's, not, we can't do anything with that. She believes that we need um, bespoke legislation. And the best way to do that is for us to have a package of, if we've got already plans, which the Scottish government has in effect got plans for um, the Nordic model, the abolition model, but we've been having plans for a long time. Um, in 2000, just a bit of background for Scotland, in 2017 at an SNP conference, Ash Denham, who's now Minister for Community and Safety, managed to do what I failed to do in the Liberal Dems and got it passed, got the abolition model passed in Scotland for the SNP. And as they have a massive majority, you'd have thought, right, it would have been, um, you know, pretty good. But, they haven't managed to put it on their programme of legislation in the three years after that, that they were in power. We had um, a consultation, a piece of research done, and we've had a consultation, and it's supposed to be going on the programme of legislation, but never quite gets there. We've been told that's because the civil servants, the unelected civil servants, don't agree with it and they don't want to put it through. So that's interesting. And that was MSPs telling us that. So um, coming back, if we had the bespoke legislation, we had the criminalization of buying and the decriminalization of selling, including the revoking of convictions that women have had for soliciting, together with the procuring of prostitution being made illegal, that would be a very strong package and that's what we want to have. We also want to have um, capacity building in you know, hospitals and mental health services um, and a whole social services, a whole range of our public services, the police where they understand what happens to women when they're prostituted and they treat them as Julie was saying, like when those um, girls are, are groomed and raped and so on, the attitude is it's a lifestyle choice when it absolutely isn't. It's, it, and the police need an awful lot of um, training on this. Now, I was very, very fortunate, I'll just put this in, to go on the parliamentary trip to Sweden in 2019, which was amazing because we saw the police, the prosecution service, the people who evaluated the Nordic model there, and um, the ambassador for trafficking, the, we saw people who supported women with exit services, and it was um, just the most amazing thing. They, um, just in case people were were aware in 1999 they passed the abolition the sex purchase law which was the abolition of prostitution under those um, things that I've just said the bespoke legislation which we want to emulate 
And people say it's not been successful. It has been hugely successful. The prostitution and trafficking is negligible there and they're very, very proud. They're all on board and they treat the um, you know, prostitution of women in so differently. Interestingly, the reason I was bringing that up, they told us about the money they had to spend on police training, which wasn't huge. I mean, it was, you know, um, several million kroner, but they did it in about four stages. So the police have a very different attitude to prostitution in Sweden than they do in, in the UK and uh, all over the world. But what has been amazing is that after legislation, the attitude of the people in Sweden changed. And if you think about it, that isn't so surprising. Those of us who are old in the tooth, like me, can remember drink driving in my parents' day when people go to the pub, knock back a skin for, get in their car and drive home. And that was acceptable from law abiding citizens. Fast forward a couple of generations, and now it is not acceptable behavior and is generally not undertaken. If you think, oh, I know a few people who do it, trust me, everybody used to do it. Seat belts, the, you know, people didn't used to put seat belts on after the law behavior changed. The law does change behavior. Look at smoking in pubs. Okay, made my point. So, um, Going back to the fact that training of the police is really, really important. And I think with this law, we can turn it around. Um, I want to go back to the um, inquiry because we did talk to Rob Richardson. He was a witness, head of the Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking Unit and uh, of the National Crime Agency. And he was, his, his statement was extremely disappointing and depressing. Okay, so he said, organized time, organized, sorry, organized crime was a top priority. And human traffickers exploit women in the sex trade because it generates huge profits. Yes, tick, we, we agree. Then he went on to say that exploitation websites are one of the most significant enablers of trafficking for sexual exploitation. Tick box, we agree. But then he said it's a complicated problem for law enforcement because the, the websites are legal, but buying a trafficked woman is illegal. So, you know, what do they have to do about that? And then he started saying that he believed the internet companies need to do more to prevent traffickers advertising victims online. And you're like, they know what they're doing. They know they're procuring prostitution. Why would they cut their own income? Because make no mistake, greed, money, power is at the root of this, as well as patriarchy and the whole lot thrown in. But money, they make a lot of money. So he then went on to say they should proactively identify victims of trafficking, but he didn't think they should be closed down because the problem would go underground. The problem will not go underground. You've just seen how easy it was, or I've told you how easy it was to get in to these websites. I think a lot of men, law, remember prostitution, buying women for sex is, a, is something that law abiding men do. There's very few law abiding men that would go onto the dark web, but they don't want their wives to find out that they buy sex. So the deterrent effect is sufficient. They're not going to go onto the dark web and you know, they, then the traffickers won't be making the money. But the, the crucial thing um, that I, I need to talk about is that exploitation websites provide opportunities or law enforcement officers to prosecute traffickers. So what they do, they cozy up to the um, uh, websites because that way they can get you know, uh, information out of them. And we were just gobsmacked at this attitude. Your law enforcement officers, this is a serious crime. 
why why aren't you using the powers that you have truthfully i don't think they have as many powers as they should so um you know exploitation websites are procuring prostitution making a fortune out of selling human beings for sex whether they're trafficked or not he doesn't want to shut them down even though he admits they've made it easy because they can get information to go after traffickers from the very same websites that incentivize the activity in the first place. I don't know about you, but I just think that is crazy. And this is coming from the head of the National Crime Agency. What sort of logic is that? You know, and prostitution can never ever be safe. What also gets me is, even if you weren't, I just got to say this, even if you were never beaten, and never sworn at and always had you know protected sex and no one was ever rude to you and you were always paid it's never safe because two things one having sex with someone you don't want to have sex with harms you it's not much it harms a person non-conceptual sex and as Liberal Democrats, what infuriates me is we are so good on, I, on the need for parity for mental health and how important mental health is. And we advocate a practice that damages mental health. The other thing is there is no such thing as a safe punter because you can never, never know the trigger for another human being's violence. And, you know, we have this femicide of two women a week who could testify to that in domestic um, violence situations. And these are men that they married, that they know, um, and so on. So how can you tell from a complete stranger? You would never be able to tell that. Now, Ruth McGuire, um, one of our conveners, was um, pretty hot on her interrogation, which amused me because she was interrogating the head of the crime agency and she, she did much better than he did. So she said um, she was surprised that the National Crime Agency was working with websites that facilitate exploitation. And she asked him whether the identification of 247 potential trafficking victims was an acceptable success rate given, as we've seen just tonight, 12,440 um, women on the site over the UK. So what happened? She, she, he, so he said, well, that wasn't the whole, you know, it, the, these were from a certain project. Um, but there were more victims identified. But when he was asked how many, he couldn't answer that. This is at a parliamentary inquiry. And then she went on to ask um, about the amount of what happens, another red flag for traffickers is that they often will pay with one credit card for multiple women. So that's a red flag. So she asked how many individuals were doing this on the site and he hadn't got the data for that either. And he also said that he didn't like to be intrusive to the websites. And, and, and as I say, she um, said, well, you know, you're the police. Uh, surely for serious crime, being intrusive is your job. Well, she didn't quite put it like that, but I, I've um, summarised <laughs> for her. So, uh, Valiant Ritchie, he was a witness, special representative and coordinator for combating trafficking in human beings at the OSCE, Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And he said, these websites increase the scale and profitability of the market dramatically. And we know that because we see the proliferation of websites and we see the volume of ads. But we also know because we talk to survivors and before these sites came along, they were sold maybe once or twice a night. Now it's 10 times because they can get buyers much, much more quickly. Now, I want to come to um, a couple of uh, people 
that uh, success stories, and I noticed on the chat line briefly, there was something about Sesta Foster, which I'm going to talk about. So what would happen if the um, websites could be closed down? According to that Rob Richardson, um, you know, they go on the dark web and it would be dreadful. But there are two instances where they have been shut down that I know of or that was in the inquiry, maybe more, I don't know. One was in France. Now, in France, procuring um, prostitution is actually illegal, but Viva Street managed to get round it and they um, were prostituting, well, they weren't prostituting, they were advertising the prostitution and procuring the prostitution of about 8,000 women. And this, um, there's an organization in France called Mouvement du Nid that supports women involved in prostitution and Lorraine Wesito, I'm probably not pronouncing that properly, a lawyer from that organization filed a complaint against Viva Street, which apparently is still ongoing, but nevertheless, their escort service closed. And overnight, the numbers of women in prostitution uh, fell because of the adverts falling, caused a huge, huge drop in demand. Second time was in America, and um, Rob Spector from CEO of Child Safe was another witness. He referred to the American legislation of Sester Foster. And this is a, something that I was totally surprised. It's the dual legislation and Sester is um, Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act. And Foster is Allow States and Victims to fight online sex trafficking act, the two bills together, they were signed into law by Donald Trump. So I was so shocked that um, <laughs> he's not all bad then. Right, moving swiftly on. So at the time they had a website called Backpage and it, 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 as soon as a, within, I think, what was it, 72 hours, 80% of the adverts went. And one of the things that um, Rob said was, it, actually, um, there weren't the exit services and support for the women available to cope. So what we would need to think about very carefully is, should we have similar legislation? We absolutely need to have the, the capacity to deal with the fallout. That would be 12,440 women in um, the UK, for example. That was only on one website who would find themselves in dire straits if, you know, it stopped. So we need to have, but, you know, they would no longer be being raped all night. We need, would need to have the capacity to support those women immediately. And also, um, we interviewed Filippo Capaldi from Police Scotland, and he said very much the same thing, how they cozy up to the exploitation websites. But one of the things that I found really worrying was um, Ruth, again, was really good at interrogating the police, and was this attitude of, women having to be, um, you know, at risk of serious harm. Well, in my opinion, we've just seen 12,444 women, uh, 440 women at risk of serious harm, but oh, they can only go in and investigate a particular thing if they've got some specific information, even though they know that this is all going on, it's incentivizing trafficking and these women have got no choice. Now, one policeman, he told us, stopped a couple in a car that he suspected of trafficking or pimping. And the policeman found a taser in the car, but he let them go. And I still can't believe that actually happened. So there's a man with a woman, he's um, 
who was they were foreign they were Romanian he has a taser in the car he let them go and the next day when they followed it up the woman had already been sent back to Romania so our findings you won't be surprised we think these advertising websites are an enabler of sexual exploitation and trafficking in Scotland. They centralise demand and incentivise trafficking, which cannot be designed out of the websites. They knowingly facilitate and pro profit from the prostitution of others and they endanger women. And what we want is the legislation, which I've said, to make it illegal to um, procure prostitution criminalise the buyers, decriminalise the sellers, and to support women fully, financially, in every way, with training, whatever it takes, to exit. And to uh, train the police. Okay. So I think I'll stop there, and you can ask me some questions. <laughs> We do have a, a question in the uh, in the chat already, but please do everybody uh, put your questions in the chat. Uh, Susan's iPad. Um, I don't know, Susan, if you if you want to ask this yourself, unmute if you if you do. Susan's iPad has got a question. I'm sure it's Susan, not just Susan's iPad. Susan. Um, maybe having difficulty unmuting. She's saying, why do so many Lib Dem women support the decriminalisation of the sex trade? That's a why really so good many question. Mm. Yeah. Do, do you know something? <laughs> oh, God, I don't really know the answer to that because it's a question <laughs> I ask all myself. I, I think... Oh... Um, I just think they believe the myths, um, you know, uh, the whole thing that it's empowering for women, that it's work, that, um, you know, I, I don't think they read the newspapers about things like Julie was saying, where you've got Rotherham, Rochdale, where we can see how uh, young girls are groomed and so on. And these are intelligent women. I had a conversation with Joe Swinson about, you know, lobbied so many people on it, half an hour's conversation. And I don't mean to be unkind, but one thing that she said was, I wouldn't want it for my daughter. And I thought, well, whose bloody daughter do you want it for? The migrants, you know, the, the, the looked after looked after child, the women in prison, the poor, you know, the refugees, for heaven's sake, the groomed, the traumatized, the children who've been through abuses, you know, the neglected. What I don't understand, and I, when I put the motion forward, uh, um, the women who came up and said I was paternalistic, maternalistic, all this, moralist, I'm not, uh, as I uh, about other people's sexual behavior as long as it's consensual. They seem to have, um, if you, <laughs> terrible things, if you go with some of the misogyny in the party, sorry to say it, you get, you get a lot of support from the guys. <laughs> um, that's probably a bit unfair, but it does seem to, uh, uh, I, I just don't know. I've argued with so many women, I just don't know. I don't see how they can see. The pimps are, are, are in, in the policy are called businessmen and everything. Well, you can call them what you like. They'll still beat you if you don't bring home the bacon. And, you know, they'll still rape you several times to, you know, and abuse you. One of the things that Fiona Broadfoot told us, she ran away from home, she was picked up, um, in a bus station by her pimp to be. She didn't know it was a pimp going to be a pimp at the time. And he took her back and had sex with her and so on. And then what would happen? He wanted her to, you know, have 
he started pimping her. And if she didn't do what he wanted, he would beat her. And she managed to get away at one point and she, she was in the center and her parents came to see her. And she'd had some, some child abuse, not from them, but from a family member before and things like that. But she had gone down this road where she felt she couldn't go back home. And she ran away and went back to her pimp. And this, in her story, in her testimony, he said to her, this chilled me, I knew you'd come back. And what I think we don't understand is the dynamic of abuse and the effect it has on the mind of abused people and in, in, in this thing, you know, in a, I don't really know how to explain it myself, but it was to me fascinating that he had sussed out what would happen better than the social workers or the people who'd had all this, you know, training at university. Anyway, I digress. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I got, I got um, lib, uh, liberal philosophy thrown at me as well. And I'm like, how is forcing somebody to do something they don't want to do, uh, you know, liberal, it, it, just by changing the words, just by causing, calling it work, just by um, saying it's empowering when you wouldn't choose it for yourself, you wouldn't choose it for your daughter. Okay. No, that's something that uh, Julie talks about in, in her book. Um, she was talking about uh, uh, um, somebody who had escaped from prostitution uh, uh, being interviewed by academics who are pro decrim or legalization and inviting them to go with her uh, around uh, and and do be pimped be prostituted for a week yeah. and see, you know get the, get their experience so they can speak properly about it and of course they weren't scared stiff weren't they <laughs> and and they wouldn't get involved what i'd like to know jackie is um, how did you get involved in this campaign in this sort of work um it's something that I haven't had, I haven't got any sort of um, personal background of prostitution. I mean, I'm not, you know, um, I don't have the, or, or any of this. I was at university and first heard about the comfort women. And I went uh, in university um, as a mature student and I just couldn't get my head around it um, that, women were abducted and, you know, used for sex and raped over and over again. I thought it was, oh, what it is, absolutely dreadful. Um, and I discovered that this was happening in our country and it just went on from there. So I started by joining Paisley Amnesty and became the chair of Paisley Amnesty. We, took, we made this our thing. We took three motions to um, the AGM, uh, the UK AGM to call for the Nordic model basically. And actually every single motion was unanimously passed. And then the International Secretariat came in with their uh, sex workers and they stood up and said, I do this for a living and this is what we want, total decriminalization. And how do you argue against that? Because you become a middle-class busybody when you say, but oh, it's harmful. What, what do you know about it? I don't from personal experience. And it completely through the, we had, we, we, the two motions were, one was, to do full decriminalization. The other one was to have no, which passed was to have no motion because there was so much disagreement. But the International Secretariat just went ahead. What people don't always realize, and Lib Dems love Amnesty International. I left after that because I was so angry with them. Amnesty International were going to have a policy that having sex was a human right. Now, how can you have a policy that having sex is a human right unless it's with yourself? 
if that includes, well, yeah, but if that includes another human being, because surely then it can only be, you know, it can't be a human right if they don't want to have sex with you. But, you know, and Julie was spot on. I totally agree. Amnesty International is um, an organization for men's rights. And every now and again, they throw in a thing on violence against women, you know, um, as a sort of uh, project thing, you know, to, um, and everybody's, yeah. And then they go back to their usual thing. It took a long, long time for them to even recognize abortion. It was absolutely a no-no, not even for rape, you know, victims of rape. So it just shows you that background. Uh, yeah, so I left. Um, and uh, we, we, we heard, didn't we, that uh, the Nordic model isn't only in the Nordic countries, and it's actually in Northern Ireland and the Republic. They both yes. adopted. So can you fill us in a little bit on how it's working there? Yes, um, actually, it's improving. It wasn't working so well to start with, and that is to be expected, but it's getting better, and that is to be expected. The critical actors after legislation are the police. And um, my motion, incidentally, included training for the police, which I put before the Lib Dems, which didn't actually, wasn't in it, the original purchase, Sex Purchase Act in Sweden, although they did training, because I think it is absolutely crucial. They need to have a completely different mindset once that mindset um, embeds, which is prostitution is a form of violence against women. Women in prostitution are vulnerable and are victims. They are not equal players. And as Julie said, there may be a small minority of women for whom this isn't, uh, you know, they, they, the high, although Diane Martin Robertson will tell you she was a high class escort and she always tells audiences, you, you know, when you're raped in, you know, and you've got a mini bar and a posh hotel, it's actually not that much different from being raped anywhere else. You feel the same, the degradation's the same, the beatings are the same. So, you know, don't kid yourself on really. Um, and I think uh, it, it, it will continue to improve. It was probably easier to get it passed um, in Ireland because of the religious background. And, and I think some people did vote for it in terms of morality because it was a, a weird coalition between you know, radical feminists going for it and Catholic priests, only time they've ever probably been on the same side. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> it's had its teething problems. Um, and I think, but I think it's, it's definitely bedding in and getting better. Certainly we had Monica <laughs> O'Connor saying that it was getting there, yeah. That's good to know. I've uh, got another question from uh, from chat. Somebody's saying, is it a class issue? Is it because working class women and girls are easy to overlook? Um, sorry, I missed the first part of the question. Is it because it's, it, it, it's prostitution? Is, yes. it, is, is prostitution a class issue in that working class girls are easy to overlook and nobody cares and nobody notices much about them? I think it's about choice as well. So, um, and if you're middle class, you're usually wealthier and you've uh, got parents who've got resources. So on the whole, you probably are doing better in terms of your education attainment. And you go to university, you have choices. I'll come back to that in a minute because there are sugar daddy sites, I'll come back. If you're um, poorer, uh, and you live in, in an area of deprivation, then you've got um, less resources, you've got less choices, 
you've also got people who you've got vulnerability um, because you've probably got more uh, gangs around, more, more you know, drugs and alcoholism and everything like that. So sometimes um, it's because you just by your circumstances and where you're living and all of that sort of thing. Going back to the students, um, because they will be predominantly uh, middle class, not because um, they are any cleverer than working class women and girls, but as I said, poverty affects the attainment gap and they're more likely to be there. I went to talk about the Nordic model at Aberdeen University to a group of students. And one of the uh, young women asked me about sugar daddy sites there's a, because they're quite popular. And I think a lot of young women are, it's being suggested that it's a good idea to perhaps do it because you can get your, um, you don't have to leave university with a huge debt and um, you know, you can get dated and so on and take out for nice meals. And I said to her, actually, I don't, I had to be very careful because I didn't want to upset anybody, particularly in the group who might be using them. But I said, it is at the end of the day, prostitution. I said, you are being bought by a man who has plenty of money and wants a young body to have sex with. And he doesn't really care about you or your education or anything else. And, you know, he's using you. Um, it's, you know, is that, it's just, you, know, you can say it's, this is her friend of hers that said it was so empowering, but is that really empowering to be used by another human being for sex? You know, um, and she said afterwards to me, oh, thank you for saying that, because I think that's exactly what she did feel. But the, you know, fashion, the peer group pressure and everything was this is the thing to do. And it's interesting when we've, we had a young woman come to the CPG, um, I, I got in touch with her and anyway, long story, but she'd done some research on trafficking and prostitution and she was very pro the Nordic model. We just happened to have a young woman in who'd come as a guest of someone else. And the question she asked about the uh, piece of research, <laughs> wasn't on the research itself. She asked the, the other lady, what did your fellow students, how did you cope with your fellow students? Because she knew it, uh, uh, that when she's obviously put her head above the parapet, this isn't, the, the Nordic model isn't the woke way. And um, you, you will get a lot of comments and, and um, people will be ignoring you and all the rest of it. Uh, it's not a, it's not a fashionable thing to think. And she wondered that that was the question: how this other student had managed to do, you know, a piece of research on it, a PhD on something that would have been so unpopular. So we're back to that whole Lib Dem women thing, yeah. And apparently, the young Lib Dems in Scotland <laughs> call me a swerf. I'm a swerf. Wow, well, there you go. And the stupid thing is, I think to myself, but look at those young women on that website. They're your, to, I want to say to the young, and I actually said to one of them who told me this, I'll come and talk to you. I'll come and talk to you, listen to me. Because these girls are their age. These are the, they, they're, their peer group being sold. And to men, they would absolutely hate to be, having to do some of those things on that, to sleep with people they don't know, and then another one and another one and another one. I don't know why they think it's empowering. I, I just don't know. Um, so it might not- And yet it used to be that, 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 that everything, it used to be that everything in Sweden or, or uh, Norway was, was cool and and sophisticated wasn't it so maybe we want to revitalize that idea but if you want to call one of the cool gang go the nordic way absolutely the green party in sweden are pro nordic model so that's quite interesting because of course the green party in scotland are well, uh, full decrim yeah 
that'd be interesting seeing as their um, um policy on that is very different to the SNP but anyway we've got a question uh, from Sarah sounds as though um there's a fair amount of misogyny in the Lib Dems uh-huh I place so much faith in the police there is evidence that the police repeatedly fail vulnerable girls who are pimped like in Rochdale as we heard from Julie uh, and indeed in Oxford um, and several other places have you a comment on that yeah I would actually say um that's one of the things I was trying to get across with some of the comments from the police um this I don't think uh I, faith in the police than I do now. I accept and, uh, that there will be good people there trying their best, uh, you know, as there are in every profession. But actually, my opinion of them is rock bottom. I, I, I just think there's, you know, no common sense. And I feel I feel a bit guilty because I'm sure there are some people in pockets of things like domestic abuse who are really trying hard to protect women and who are doing the right thing and so on and so forth. But Rochdale, I don't know if you saw, um, I think it was called The Three Girls, the BBC documentary, drama documentary yes. um, on the Rochdale uh, Rotherham scandal. And, you know, uh, it, yeah, I, and then we found, as we already knew, that wasn't a one-off. Um, Birmingham, Oxford, you know, it's probably rife across the whole country. And the attitude, and, you know, I, I don't, I just, that that's why I'm saying, you know, training for the police is absolutely crucial. And the fact that a policeman let a man with a taser in his car go and didn't arrest him for having a you know such a a weapon on him it just beggars belief and they sort of being exploited it's a serious crime to you and i but they don't you know they've got to have, but our legal system and um, doesn't back them up if you've got you know i think it must be to be fair really really hard where you've got to toe the line I think they get a lot of stick from the pro prostitution lobby as well, uh, but it's up to legislators. It's up to the it's up to the politicians to change the law. Yeah, Helen Baxter's got a question. If you want to unmute yourself, Helen, and then Liz Sleeper's got a a, a, a corollary to that. Helen, have you got a question? You commented um, in chat. Hello. I don't know if it's so much a question, but I was just saying about how, or do we agree that young women today, more than ever, base their self-worth on the approval of men and, and getting their validation is about having the right look, having the right, you know, body shape, image on Instagram, whatever it might be. And that they've somehow young women today don't realise there are other ways to get that boost to your self-esteem that, that, you know, young people need. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth in that because I think the... <laughs> the media and the social media push this all the time but what is fascinating is what is coming out of the website revelations website the revelations of kids at school mm -hmm. and i think that um my daughter-in-law actually is a, a health worker in, a, a sexual health worker in schools and you know and has told me for a long long time that girls are being raped in school but, and how awful it is for them. But, you know, as the report said, the, I um, can't remember who it was, but head of inspectorate, I think said, this is happening in every school. And I, I think there's a, I don't know whether it's validation because there's an attitude from boys, which is, you know, based on, frankly, probably the pornography that they're all watching at home on their machines and we can't separate the behavior of boys from you know what they're watching at home and I don't know whether it's I don't know whether it's 
validation so much from boys as from other teenage girls because if you're out of the group peer pressure has always been a really it's, it's that time in your life that you're moving away from your parents but you still need you know approval and everything and each other and I just feel I feel so desperately sorry for our young people at the moment and particularly women and I think there is a I think the misogyny is worse than it's ever been. I mean, you expected, you know, one of the girls apparently in lockdown said she was relieved not to go to school because we're sold this thing, everybody's missing school. Well, not everybody is because she wasn't photographed, up, skirted photographed every time she goes up, up, up the stairs. And other girls have had, you know, photographs taken of them and shown all around their classmates and all that humiliation. I just, um, you know, by the boys and ne never has it been so important really to have boys out of toilets and girls' toilets. I'm actually thinking, you know, we ought to go back to the single sex schooling because I just feel girls are so unsafe at the moment and they can't get on with their work, you know, uh, which is, and, and just being human beings and it's thrust down your throat so I think you can go two ways I think you, you get into it because that is seen as you know the, the the new way to grow up to be you know piercing your ears having a tattoo wearing makeup false eyelashes you know all the boys or you just completely shun away from it because you just find the whole thing too threatening um it frightens me I've got a granddaughter of 11 with autism and it just absolutely terrifies me, uh, to be mm -hmm. honest. I don't uh, Liz Sleeper had a comment. Uh, Liz, you were going to say something about... Uh, well, I was uh, just saying, see. when you're talking about young women and their attitudes to sex, is, this is from arguments with my own daughters, actually. They, they feel very strongly that... Um, if I, you know, I've got I've got one daughter who goes out wearing next to nothing, and I'm like, could you pull your, could you wear a slightly, you know, could you wear something different? And she's always furious with me and, and accuses me of slut shaming her. Um, uh, I know where, uh, which is the point when I go, no, I'm not, I'm not actually. It, that's even even using that word as a patriarchal word. Yeah. Um, but. But there's definitely this sense that somehow they equate it with liberation, and also they, they they're like, well, I should. I should be able to wear what I want. I, you know, I shouldn't get any harassment. I should be able to wear what I want. And on the one hand, I I see her point, but on the other hand, no. So anyway, so anyway, there's just, there does just seem to be this big, big thing about you mustn't slut shame people, you mustn't kink shame people, you mustn't, you, you know, you mustn't shame anybody in any way, but. They've muddled that. They've got muddled in being so concerned about not shaming people that somehow they've lost something in that. I completely agree with you. A lot of this logic as well is totally muddled. But the thing that I would say, um, well, I, I, rhetorically, I know I have a daughter of my own, is, um, you know, when you say, um, I, you know, I shouldn't be told what to wear. Are you really wearing what you want to wear or are you wearing what the media and the social media and your peer group say is the uniform? Because that's in fact no different to how we all were, I'm sure when we were teenagers, whatever the, the you know, Vogue is, um, you, you know, I was a late hippie, uh, it nearly it disappeared just as I was getting there, but I wanted to have, you know, long skirts and a hat and bells and all that rubbish. Actually, I love it, but never mind. Do you see what I mean? What, what, so this is the uniform and the uniform, I, I remember having um, this argument and debate about uh, with, when I, as a mature student, I went into this, um, long story but anyway group of youngsters and they were all talking the the question was you know about rape and one of the young the, the lecturer said 
is what a woman wears, you know, um, a factor? And the, one of the young men said, yes. And I can tell you, it was like red rag to a bull to me. And I just <laughs> vented my rage because of course the only person responsible for raping someone is the rapist, mm. um, absolutely. But the point was, I was angry that, you know, this is a whole generation um, gone and we're still asking the same stupid question and we're still getting the same stupid answer. I do remember saying to him, in which case every shop in Bray Head, which is a shopping mall, you know, every clothes shop should have a government health warning because, you know, every scar is just below your bottom. How do you how do you cope when the fashion is totally against you? It is absolutely, you know, frustrating. And in principle, of course, you should wear what you want to wear. But actually, are you wearing what you want to wear or what you want to wear in order to be fashionable and in with the in crowd as we all, we all, we all want to be that. You know, it's not nice being on the outside. Um, Can I make another point, yeah. which is, uh, thank you, which is, which is more about men, actually. I remember when I was a student, recognising, you know, realising sort of one in the figures, sort of one in eight women had been sexually abused. And so I'd look around the group and think, gosh, that means at least two people in this group of friends have probably been abused. And I, so I've only just recently thought, well, that means that I don't know what the figure is, but maybe one in 10, one in 20, I don't know what the figure is, men have raped women. I probably know men who've raped women and I don't know who they are. And it's a point that I now make to men, which they find mm. rather sobering and makes them think. Uh, listen, Liz, I am totally 100% with you on that because see the numbers of men who buy sex could be our partners, our husbands, our sons, you know, um, yeah, and you know, you don't, you don't know, because if you knew, they wouldn't be doing it. And yes, and I find the other thing that gets me, I'm reminded of Schindler's List when the, you know, commandants would go, in the in the Auschwitz and places would be um, doing appalling cruelty and killing Jews, and they'd go home for their tea and sit their kids on their knee and be a good daddy. And we are no different because when a man walks in, when he goes onto that site and he browses that site and he picks a woman and who's probably a girl. And he goes in, negotiates with a man what he's going to do to that girl. Has he had a lobotomy? Oh, I don't think so. Does he know what he's doing? He knows he is using his power and his money to rape somebody without any legal um, recourse. That's what he's doing. And he can pretend. That's why they put independent, because it sells the conscience. But he isn't an idiot. He's got a perfectly good job. He's got a perfectly good brain. He can't claim ignorance. He can't claim he doesn't know exactly what he's doing. Uh, walking into that apartment with this young foreign girl who can't speak English and negotiating with a man what he's going to do to her. And then he goes home to his wife. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Anna McCracken has got a question. Anna, are you ready? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Jackie, for your contribution. And I was interested that Julie Bindell um, included pornography in her sort of wider definition of prostitution. And, um, and I'm just interested in that whole area, really, because it is so mainstream and acceptable and normalised in adult life. Um, and yet it's, I'm just interested in any thoughts or reflections you have on how that then filters down into the lives of children because 11 year old boys are only accessing pornography because adults have produced it and made it available for them. Absolutely and I've got something else to say about children um, accessing pornography in a minute so if I don't remember to if I go off on a tangent remind me that 
uh, Digital Economy Act. So I once read um, pornography described as filmed prostitution. And I think that is the best way to think about it. It is, uh, you know, all those women are prostituted because they are paid for having sex and they're being filmed. And there's coercion in pornography for the uh, women, just as there is everywhere else. They lured in by the glamour thing and all that, but in the end, they're often coerced into doing things they don't want to do, things that are painful, um, and then they very rarely get any money from it. If they get, they get, well, they get, they probably get paid for that particular session. But for example, the amount of money that's made from uh, pornography, uh, it's a phenomenal amount, right? Uh, it, it, they don't get any rights to a particular film or anything like that. They just get paid for the session. And often they leave, as women in prostitution leave, poorer than when they went in. Now, going back to children, I don't know if you're aware, but we did a web, um, a web not wasn't a website, it was a, our previous CPG meeting was, and I might have recorded it actually, in which case, if I have, I'll let Alison know, was um, about the uh, verification of websites. Now, some of the children's charities had got together and lobbied the government over seven years to make, um, have adult verification on pornography websites. Now, I don't know if you know, but for example, there's an um, adult verification on betting websites. You can't place a bet if you're under 18. There's a law that says you can't have a tattoo if you're under 18. But anybody can, of any age can access um, a pornography. And it is possible to put adult verification onto pornography websites. So in... 2019 there was a bill and it was passed in the UK Parliament a cross-party bill passed and it became an act that they would be put on but the bit that affects it was other things as well the bit that affects the adult verification was not enacted now, I'd never heard of this before. I don't know if you are aware. Oh, anyway, you can pass a bill in Parliament and it requires to be enacted by a minister. And if it's not enacted by a minister, it can't be enacted. So it's in limbo. It sits there and we actually could stop children accessing pornography and the reason, apparently, the two guys who represented the um, charities were saying, they think it was because Boris Johnson thought that um, men wouldn't vote Tory if he enacted this bill. I remember at the time seeing a bit of a flurry from the Lib Dems, who also didn't want this particular thing enacted either or made law because of course they I don't know why I don't understand why Lib Dem men would like children to see hardcore violent misogynistic pornography but apparently they also um, you know didn't want didn't want it to become law and I think it is abhorrent. There are children as young as three because sometimes they see it by accident. And there's things like on YouTube, I think, where they flash um, pornography onto children's sites. So they'll be watching a children's program and then, you know, you get a, a, a piece of porn put in. And well, people who say it's just fantasy and I really don't mean to be unkind and haven't, ago but I heard Joe Swinson say that it's just fantasy um, and is harmless. It is not harmless. We're seeing the effects of it in school. It's also done to real people. 
So it's not harmless in its making, it's not harmless in its effects. And if men, they spend all this money on pornography and prostitution, that's the spare change in their pocket. That's a really good point. I tell you what Rob Spector said. He said to us, you, he said the sex trade globally is worth $99 billion. He said that's more money than you could possibly imagine. He said, you know, it's like Facebook and Google and Apple and all those, you know, it's all of that. It's plus 20 football clubs. He said, it's, it's enormous. It's beyond enormous. And I sat there and I thought, that's spare change. So we could actually save the planet with 99 billion pounds or whatever. Or we could destroy women and children. So men, that's my open challenge to you. Which do you, which do you want? I, I, it, it, but anybody who says this isn't patriarchy gone mad, I don't know what is. And, you know, we're in Scotland, we've got a woman. That's uh, a fantastic. First, oh, thank you, First Minister. We've got a lot of women uh, MSPs, quite a good percentage. We've got equally safe as a government uh, thing, women should be equally safe, prostitution is a form of violence. And yet, We've got 788 young girls being sold for, for raping on our websites. So there you go. That's on one, one website. So I don't think much. Oh, of... my connection just. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So let, let's, um, let's do something about it. Yeah, I think that's a really great idea. Um, has anybody got any more questions? Because we've had a really good discussion. And I'm wondering whether um, we, can, we can capture the, the chat here uh, before we finally finish. I don't know whether we can, but there's several really good websites uh, that, that are being uh, put on the chat. And if, you, if, you can, uh, if somebody can scrape this, um, this chat and uh, get some of these interesting points, Rachel Barker's saying the BBC and Netflix are doing their bit to promote prostitution as a fun, empowering choice for women with all their happy hawker type shows. I haven't seen this, of course. Secret of a Call Girl, Harlots, don't know anything about that. But it glosses over what it really involves. Everybody's pretty and smiling. That's, that goes back to the happy hooker back in the, the 70s, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I know, it's just a, it's, I, it's not even a myth, it's a downright lie, which is why, um, you, you know, whenever you're doing anything uh, like a motion or a fringe or something, you need to have a prostitution survivor. And I feel terrible sometimes because these are women who have had the most appalling trauma and, you know, um, have exited, managed to exit have managed to heal and come back and will then stand up and speak in front of an audience at their trauma, how much that might be a trigger, how much they relive it. And the only thing I can say is every single prostitution survivor that I've heard speak, it chokes me up even to say this, you know, because I have had to try and stop myself. Tears coming to my eyes. I feel I'm not fit to <laughs> clean their shoes. They are giants, absolute giants. And it's very hard to hear them speak and walk away. A bit like William Wilberforce said, you know, you can... Um, walk away uh, but you can can't pretend you don't know and after you've heard them you absolutely can't pretend you don't know but uh yeah as i said the lib dems voted diane best speaker and voted against our motion <laughs> <laughs> and sarah says why so angry with everybody else we should be angry with ourselves for condoning human trafficking when we buy fruit and veg from a supermarket, 
So they are used in those plastic greenhouses and if they die in the heat, they are thrown out with rubbish. Are those slaves that provide us with cheap veg also being sexually abused? We all play a role in human trafficking. That's a very profound thought. I completely and utterly agree. Totally agree. We've got a con we've got this, uh, you know, continuum trafficking that's at bottom of you know different work practices and always trying to, uh, you know, not the 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 zero hour contract and all of those sorts of things. We've got a, a, a society that's rotten at its core. And yeah, we all are complicit. What really upset me about, um, was by the way, qualify this, delighted about the Black Lives Matter, uh, matters thing flaring up, wonderful, uh, that racism, because often, of course, intersectionality, black people and ethnic minorities, um, you know, are also, uh, have double and treble jeopardies, but was the amount of people who said slave, you know, slavery is over now. And I'm like, you must be joking. There are more slaves alive today now than there have been in the whole of history, which is a terrible, terrible thing. So yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Um Julie uh, quoted Andrea Dawkin right at the beginning of her book. Um, I'll just read this out because I think it's a really interesting thing to think about. Dawkin asks that we remember the prostituted, the homeless, the battered, the raped, the tortured, the murdered, the raped then murdered, the murdered then raped. I want you to think about those who have been hurt for the fun, the entertainment, the so-called speech of others. Those who have been hurt for profit, for the financial benefit of pimps and entrepreneurs. I want you to remember the perpetrator, and I'm going to ask you to remember the victims, not just tonight, but tomorrow and the next day. I want you to find a way to include them, the perpetrators and the victims, in what you do, how you think, how you act, what you care about, what your life means to you. I think that's a really profound thing, isn't it? Um, Absolutely. I'm gonna, Spot yeah, on. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all for your questions. And thanks to all of you for joining us in this conversation. I've been really good tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank you so much, Jackie, for what you've been able to tell us. It's been really interesting hearing about this. And I think that's the next big campaign for Scotland is to get, you know, a lot of women campaigning for this motion that uh, that the SNP voted through in their conference to come to, to, to be en enacted. <laughs> um, it, it's been really interesting to see how close to the surface these activities lie. It's quite shocking. Uh, and I'm just going to remind you, we're preparing now for our next talk on the 12th of July with Professor Kathleen Stock, who will be discussing her book, Material Girls. Um, I'm going to ask you all to look out for the announcement or better still, sign up to our website, liberalvoiceforwomen.org, and we'll send you the invitation as soon as it comes out. Thanks to our technical staff and organisers without whom this wouldn't have happened. Thanks to all of you for being part of a really interesting and challenging session. And most of all, to our speakers, Julie Biddle, who's had to leave, and Jackie Storm, who's kept the session going so brilliantly. Her <laughs> most thoughtful looking session. A lovely evening. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you very much for having me and for listening. Thank you so much. <laughs> I've enjoyed it. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Cheers now. <laughs>